First thing I do is I take the tension off the arm here. And so this tension arm is what controls the spin on this take-up reel. So as long as there's any tension on this, the platter will spin. So you gotta take all the tension off. So that way you can handle the film without worrying about this thing taking it out of your hand. Or this is all head and tail. So that way we have um, film we can work with with our hands without actually touching the actual print. It saves the print from wear and tear and fingerprints and all sorts of stuff. spins fast enough that if one of these is ever loose, it will literally, I have one of these pop off and hit right here. <laughs> Bam! Took the whole thing. So you always have uh, Velcro on these, keep them secure, and you always have a wrap on because um, what happens is, is uh, if you ran the film like this, and I take this ring out in the center, then there's nothing supporting the film. This thing ever stopped in like an emergency situation, like I have to stop it immediately. Um, this thing will come to a really fast stop, and since there's nothing holding it on the inside or the outside, the film will go into the floor. <laughs> so, that's why you always have either the center ring in the film, or you have these clamps on the outside so they can kind of hold it on if it spins around. It's, uh, these films right here, they're only about maybe 150 to 200 pounds, but when you're dealing with like a feature length film like Star Wars, this film, as you can see here, it's going to be 400 pounds. And so it's a lot more potential energy as it's spinning around. So if it stops, it's going to go. <laughs> so you always got to have clamps on it. And right here, this is our heat control unit. It's also known as the brain. The brain, the brain basically regulates the speed of the platter while the film's pulling um, through the center. So the brain controls how fast it spins while it's going into the projector. And then the tension arm controls how fast it spins coming out of the projector. So when we load a film, first off we pull this ring, which is really awkward because this thing's huge. Uh, all right. And then we will roll up our film. Like I was saying, just like the film has tail, this is head. And so we can touch this without affecting the actual quality of the print. This is actually an old trailer for, I can't remember exactly what. And this is that foil tape I was telling you about. And this foil tape will stop the projector at the start frame. And so that keeps everything in sync. plugs into the center hub here. Now, uh, the brain won't engage until this little gate is closed. And so when this gate closes, the sensors turn on. And as the film moves through right here, it will dictate how fast this spins. And so it can slow it down. It can... Um, Speed it back up just as the movie runs around. And uh, the reason the speed is variable is because as the film moves out, you're getting wider and wider reels of film. And so by the time this movie's over, it's not really spinning that fast at all. But the first about five or ten minutes, this thing's going to be booking. Because that's when it's going to throw a clip or catch your finger. All right. Now I'm going to um, and then every one of these twists and turns is part of the sequence that allows this thing to move without putting any undue tension or stress on the film. It also allows it to be projected properly, because if any one of these twists is wrong, 
Your film's actually going to be upside down when it's projected on the screen. So, like I was saying earlier, it takes about six weeks worth of training to really get it down, and it's just straight rope repetition. Okay, you just want to make sure everything's right. You want to make sure everything is on its roller properly, because if everything's loose, it can hop off like this, or Lord helps you, it completely comes off. <laughs> Okay, these are particle transfer rollers. Uh, this cleans the film before we clean the film, basically. Um, they're polyurethane, they got a little stick on them, and they will pull all the dust and um, bits of loose film and things off the actual um, reel as it runs. So this is your first stage of cleaning. And so by the time it comes into the projector, it shouldn't have any extra dust or anything. Now from here, I'm gonna have to go that way. Um, I have a guideline here. This guideline has to line up with this line of frame on the film. And if that's off or out of alignment, the film doesn't pull through the head of the projector right, and it will actually pop the curves, or in a worst case scenario, break the film. So this is really important. So I'll line that up, and put your stator down, and we'll go this way. And uh, right here, this little arm is the fan unit. And this is the thing that guides the film forward every frame. So every frame, it's hitting in these, uh, into the perfs and scooting it forward. Every frame, it's moving. And so if this is ever out of alignment, what it'll do, instead of going through the perfs like this, it'll actually punch them. And so it's not a good situation. So every, um, about every three months when we change the bulb and everything, we recalibrate this to make sure everything's in sync. Basically, every frame, it's hitting stop, 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 stop. So while it looks like it's moving smoothly in a circle, it's actually stopping on every frame to press it up against this field flat. Make things a little quieter for us. Um, you know, that's our, uh, the suction's from a vacuum, and that's what keeps this connected to the field flattener. Um, if you have any issues with the film itself, then it'll break the seal, and if it breaks the seal, then it can mess up the loop, which will mess up the whole projection system. In a case like that, usually the projector will automatically stop itself, and um, in a worst case scenario, you'll have to cut some film and splice it together and fix it. So we got all that, we got our loop. We'll come down here, and we finish our loop on this one right here. One thing you wanna be careful when you're loading is you wanna keep this slack up, because if you don't, the film will roll into the sprockets here, and it'll pop the purse. Not bad, but it just doesn't sound real good. So we're gonna load up here, and so this is our another our next uh, sprocket. And so just like the other one, I have to line up the lines. And this completes our rolling loop. So when I put the stator down here, you'll see that I have the loop here, and then it forms on the other side as well. And so that keeps that film right up against the, um, the field flap here. So, once you have everything set up, you do a couple of spins just to make sure everything sounds right. Make sure that's lined up. And that's lined up, so that's good. Then come over here. And then on this side, we bring it forward. We just make sure this is still lined up. And everything looks good. And then um, right here, you can actually see the foil that's going to come up and stop the projector as we jog it into place. Probably should have given that a little more head time, but it should operate properly. All right, so we got this, this, and this. So from here, I will hand off the film to Zach so I can close up the hood. And then this right here is called the sock. Basically, it's, um, it's a little uh, air-filled cushion, 
And so what this does, when the film starts, this fills with air and it seals all the excess light around the edge of the uh, lens. So if you did not have this on during a projection, light would bleed out from these edges when the, uh, when the dowser opens. And so you'd have a little white crescent of light around the center of the image. And so this prevents that from happening. Usually when you're training, this is the one thing everybody usually forgets at first. <laughs> but it's easy to fix. Now from here, you can see uh, Zach carried on the film. Went from here, up, down, and then in and back. His, uh, when it goes to the take-up reel, it's actually doing the invert, the uh, inverse of what it does when it comes in. So you can always make sure your, re your uh, film um, twists are right because these go forward and then going to the reel is backwards. So it's always forward, back, forward, back. And if you look up here, you can see that these point in opposite directions. So everything's opposite. And then is every and, uh, if everything's lined up properly and secure, then it should all roll into place and move smooth. stretch a little <laughs> but uh, basically what he's doing is is that you want to make sure you have enough film around that hub so that it has um, enough tension to pick up and reel up the rest of the film if the um, if the reel is ever too loose when you tighten it up when you back this up like um, when we're doing the elevator this will actually spin backwards and so if it's too loose then you'll have a little slippage because it's losing tension here we activate our real units, make sure they're secure. You get your light here and your light here, and that tells you that these are the two reels that are going to be talking to each other. And then we can turn off the rest of these blinking ones because they aren't talking to each other. The uh, brain regulates feeding the film to the projector, and then the, um, the tension arm um, controls the speed of the take-up reel. So they both work in unison to make sure that the film smoothly transitions up and out and around. So this is DTAC. This is our sound sync system. Um, unlike traditional like 35 film, you know, um, our soundtrack is actually separate from the film itself. Um, the reason it's separate is because it allows us to use more screen real estate for the whole print. So um, IMAX was one of the first people to actually do this. Um, a lot of them, a lot of the uh, other projectors, when they went digital, you know, it was a solid, you know, a single file. Um, in the case of IMAX, since replicating 70 millimeter film was not technically feasible until like this year, <laughs> what they had to do is they had to separate the soundtrack from the film. And so in the old days, you'd have like a two big, actually it would fit right here. It would be um, two big tape reels. And so you had to sync the tape reel with the projector and make sure everything ran in sync throughout the presentation. So um, this is, uh, they added this into the system starting in 98. Um, and it's basically the soundtrack comes on a DVD. It's a proprietary format. And um, you pull the soundtrack off, put it on the hard drive. And then you can load our show. So uh, we'll load it up. And uh, what you'll see here is everything loads up and your showtime resets. Um, Basically, these numbers, once we have everything queued up, will start chasing each other as soon as the projection starts, and that will ensure that the sound stays in sync with the film. Um, if you ever have an issue where your frame count is wrong, um, as long as it's on the computer side, the show time, we can fix it. If it's ever from the projection time, then we have to start over, because um, unfortunately, if the projector's giving us bad time code, we can't force it to chase it. Because this is, a, this is your physical image and then this is just your sound. Okay, so right here we'll cue it into place. All right, and then what we'll do next is um, we'll jog up the film. Basically, this makes sure that the film is in the proper start block. So uh, we'll pick our show, Star Wars Episode Seven, and we'll initiate. And then from here, Star Wars Episode Seven, we auto jog.
and then you'll uh, see everything locks into place. And then we reset our frame count here. And if you look at the screen, the uh, frame count is shifted back to uh, 59, 52. That's the official starting point when you're rolling up a film, because you have to have eight seconds for the film to run before it reaches proper speed to reveal to the public. And so from there, let's see what time is it. Oh, yeah, what time to start. Okay, so we have everything jogged up. We'll load, a, um, we'll load a light file here. These files are run by our lighting system to ensure that each one starts and ends properly. So Star Wars is an extra long film. So the lights will immediately drop as soon as the announcement is over. And then two hours and 16 minutes into the film, the lights will come back up as soon as the film's over. From here, we'll raise the film into our start position. <laughs> Now we're in the rise position. Um, once it's uh, the, the projector is raised to the start position, the uh, port closure will open, and you'll be able to get an indication of it doing here. And then we exit out. And then this is our remote enable. Basically, when you saw the film stop by itself earlier, this sets up the system so you can do that. If you don't have your remote enabled, if you try to start the show, you have to start it by hand. Which isn't a bad thing, it's just it's an extra step. So now everything's good here, everything's good here. Um, these numbers you have to keep synced to because this is our backup time code in case anything else goes wrong. So everything's lined up, our lights are ready, our show is ready, and then all we have to do is press play. And you'll hear the announcement momentarily. Welcome to the John W. Woods IMAX Dome Theater at McWayne Science Hall. Everything's sounding good right now. Usually if something was out of sync or off a roller, You'd hear kind of a crunching noise, it's bad. If I ever heard that during a presentation, you'd immediately stop, make sure everything's lined up right, and then you can start back. But, so you can see right here where it's actually having to compensate because it's actually put a little too much film. So it'll actually start slowing down, you know, struggle its way back around until it calibrates properly. It usually does this dance for about the first three minutes of the movie just because it has to move so fast to keep up with 24 frames per second. Worst case scenario, if one of these clips came off, it would hurt. And if you ever tried to put your hand on here, it would probably break a finger. So you have to be really careful with it once it started like that.